Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Here it goes, it folks. Here it is, the, the largest newspaper in the state of Oregon. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, the Oregon Voters Digest. Hey, election time is here. Pr hey, primary time is here. I mean, we've got a number of candidates. I mean, we've got issues. The thing we're interested in is the public. We want solutions. That's what we want to talk about. And in most cases, uh, that's exactly what the public should understand because they, too, are waiting for, i.e., to listen to issues that are very much involved, but also the solutions to those issues. And that's really where we are focused here at the Oregon Voters Digest. Well, I'll tell you what, I've got quite a panel here. I've kind of given it sort of a different air now since I've been around this business for quite some time. I've got some candidates on here with us, and then I've also got a person that sort of, when I started this whole piece about this particular era of, uh, of the election, I've got another person with me that's with me to talk about that, and I'm talking about Teresa. Teresa, how you doing there? I'm good. How okay. are you? Okay. I'm sure you recognize Teresa. I mean, you probably recognize her husband, Don, too. He's the Navy guy that I know real well, and, and uh, he's my police commissioner if, in fact, um, when, when, when in fact I'm going to be mayor of the state of Portland. We won't talk about that right now because we've got other things we want to talk about. But what we're going to do here now is that um, we're going to talk a little bit about but when one gets into into this era of filing to run for office, very, very important. And uh, so when you think about it, when I think about it, uh, Teresa, when I, I think, I'll throw it on the table. When I filed to run for mayor of the city of Portland, the, the only, option, only thing I had to do was put my name down, a phone number, and 50 bucks for the mayor of the city of Portland. Is that enough? No way. There should be more. As far as I'm, I'm just going to throw this out on the table uh, for the benefit. Uh, I'll be introducing these guys, too. But uh, the idea is that somewhere on that form, there should have been something that talks about issues. You know, someone else, somewhere on that form, uh, the, the person who's filing to run for that office should be given something as part of these are the issues that have yet to be res re re responded to one, one way or the other mm -hmm. that I should be aware of. In any addition, maybe one or two issues from the sitting, let's say the sitting mayor, let's say that matter, and then I would have to be as a as a as a one as a person filing to run for office, I should identify two issues that I feel with a solution, i.e., which I feel would better the the situation or whatever, and then that should be a part and parcel of the filing process. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. So now. That being said, uh, now we're talking about, uh, and I'll bring, I'll bring Teresa. What do, you, what do you think about Teresa? You've been shaking your head. What do you think? That's sort of like what we were talking about initially, wasn't it? You've discussed this before, and I think it's a, a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. you know, I understand why you feel strongly about this. Okay. Now, as far as the public is concerned, naturally we've got media out there. Sure. We've got media. How do they react, if you will, to the whole issue of filing? Because the public is out there, again, too. They are the ones that are supposed to understand what's going on because they are the voting public. Mm -hmm. Okay? They should be communicated, too. So that information that I just shared from the standpoint of the filing process, that should get out to the public also. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So now we're sort of ahead of the game. We're bringing them to the table, too. Because at the end of the cycle, like we're getting here at the end of the, for the primary race, they have a, a better feel of what's going on. And then when mm -hmm. people are knocking on their doors or, or when Mia makes, presents these candidates, whether it be in a debate fashion or whatever, 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 they're ahead of the game and they can ask questions and this, that, and the you know. So I, I think that's a, I'm just throwing that out on the table. But now let me do this. Let me bring in the other, there, there are two candidates that are running. We're going to hear a little bit more about them, but I wanted to just kind of, in sort of in a, just a, just a little raw, raw presentation piece aspect of it, I want to get them involved in this deal, even though we're going to be talking about their respective office and whatever. Um, we've got we've got with us and, and, and boy I tell you Jeff has brought his deal. You got Jeff Goodman, Jeff Goodman. Mm -hmm. He's running for Secretary of State, Treasurer, Treasurer, Treasurer. Yes, sir. Treasurer. He's running for Treasurer. Okay. And uh, Ted Will, in fact, has got this seat right now. He's running for Mayor. Mm -hmm. He was just endorsed by the Oregonian, which is an interesting piece. But anyway, we got the, and then we got Bruce Cup. He's uh, he's from uh, he's from Fort Ord. Was it Mahama? 
Oh, okay. I thought, it was, I thought that was a military base. There. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Bruce is running for governor. He's been on here before. You know, you've, you've heard of Bruce before. I mean, he's a very energetic guy, knocking on doors all over the state, for that matter. But he brought the boss with him tonight, and she's looking at him. So he's, he's got to be on his, 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 his cue. Okay? I got to be good. Yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Guys, I, I'm sort of throwing this down. Like I said, we're doing this a little different than whatever. But let's have a little discussion about it. What do you think about the, some of the things that we're just throwing on the table? Of the, go ahead. Good on Bruce. What do you think? Well, how, how about your filing? When you when you filed well, the, the, the governor's office is so huge as far as what it entails, it'd be pretty tough to get it down to a couple issues. But you know the when I, when I file, it's a hundred bucks to file. The big cost is getting your your uh, into the voters guide. Okay. And 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 then that's either three thousand dollars. You got to have if you're running a statewide campaign, or it's five hundred signatures. So okay. we we got like six hundred and. 43 signatures and turn that in and, and filed that way as far okay, as getting okay. in the voter pamphlet. Okay, okay. So, but what did you know about the office? Was there an orientation at the governor's office? Did no, there the wasn't. Background? I mean, if you're going to run for governor, you better be doing some work ahead of time. I've been reading the governor's budget for 10 years. I've been watching what's been happening, uh, you know, with with the the budgetary process and and whatnot over over a long period of time. But you didn't have access. My point is that did the governor, sitting governor, call you in and say, okay, fine, you want to run for governor, and these are some of the issues that uh, are relevant. Blah 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 blah. No, because we've had a third. We've had 30 years of Democrats being governor, so they're not going to call a Republican in and say, hey, here, well, but, here's but, what you need but to would know. That, so. But would that have benefited you had had someone? Probably not. Run? It I would not. No, I don't. I don't believe so because because the philosophies are different. You okay. know, on how we're going to govern. They're they're totally different. Okay. Well, let's shift over to Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, what do you think? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, my filing was very similar to Bruce's that uh, had to get uh, 500 signatures or put in $3,000 for the information in the voters' pamphlet. Um, like Bruce, I went for the number of signatures because I think a good treasurer should watch the dollars, and I'd rather get signatures than do pay dollars uh, in for okay, it. Okay. So I did that. Uh, with respect to the uh, orientation, uh, I, although I've been following uh, some of the aspects of the treasurer's office, in particular the uh, PERS board and the investments for mm -hmm. several years now, uh, I think an opportunity to all the candidates who filed, uh, be they Republican, Democrat, or Independent, um, after everyone has filed, to have had uh, you know perhaps a half-day orientation mm -hmm. from the treasurer's office would be benefit beneficial, uh, mm -hmm. identifying what the current treasurer thinks are significant issues and also just some more detail about all the different departments. Although I can, in my case, I'm familiar with the different departments, but getting that orientation would have been a positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in like, like, here, here, this is the candidate's aspect of it. But again, from the public standpoint, the people who are going to be voting for you should basically get that same orientation, so to speak. So when when, when that when that, that happens, that should be a part of the process, you know, i.e., Oregon, which is the largest newspaper, and other local newspapers, and this, et cetera, et cetera. The public should certainly have access to all of the applicants. Yes. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's not always what happens. Yes, yes exactly, exactly. Well, anyway, I, I thought we, we, I thought I wanted to start off this whole piece about now because, because I've, I've run for office on several different occasions. Mm -hmm. Again, I was sort of like at a loss. And you find yourself in, in these debates, you know, after you get through, well, let's see, uh, you were born, uh, you went to school here. What does that have to do with the issues of, of concern <laughs> at that point in time? You got me? Mm -hmm. It's not about, uh, well, you know, hey, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I had a million bucks in the bank. And, well, I got, I, I got five bucks in the bank. Well, I got no. Well, hey, look. In all due respect, you're not sophisticated enough. You, you didn't graduate from Harvard or whatever. If that's the case, then change the application. If that's the case, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. You know, it's 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 a people's kind of a deal. It is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and we want to maintain that. And mm -hmm. I, and that's why I'm throwing it out this way. That in fact, maybe some consideration might be given, if you will, to look at that filing form, and look at the input that both the candidate and also the public has. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a I think that would be a far more effective situation because often, like today, today, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. There's an OJT period that we, as a as a community, are are the are the voting for at the end of the results, if you will. We got we got, we, got, we got to react to those situations, or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out what's going on, and during that particular time, all kinds of things happen. 
So I think that mm -hmm. just, I'm just throwing that out on the table, just from my standpoint, my background, mm -hmm. when I'm running for office and whatever. So like I said, I want to make sure we put that on the, on the table this time around. Well, okay. can, can I say no, no. something? Um, I've been very disappointed in the media in Portland the last few months because the Oregonian is very um, biased and elitist. They only promote a small number of candidates um, and uh, other newspapers that I won't mention do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's disappointing mm -hmm. because they're not including all of the candidates and that kind of exclusion is just so typically Portland and mm -hmm. it needs to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I might add also too, there's probably one particular office that we're, we're familiar with, Teresa and I are familiar with, and I'm talking about a city councilman person who was running, and that was, that was Fred Stewart. Right. And he has quite a background, for instance, like, and that's what we've been talking about. And we, the, one of the major issues here is homelessness and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and, and that kind of a deal. There's all kinds of goodies along the line, right? and, pre -pre and rent control and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And he had quite a background and the idea is that mm -hmm. that would have been nice in the discussion. Unfortunately, there was this other twist that came into this piece. Very right? destructive A twist. very personal situation. Because I've always felt that we all have stories. Right. Mm -hmm. We all have stories to tell. That's not the issue. If, in fact, that is an issue, then that should be cited on the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To say, okay, fine, you have to disclose this, 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 that, and the other mm -hmm. if, in fact, you're going to file and run for office. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case now. People, yeah. For some strange reason, media tends, a lot of times, media will take that way, that approach of deal, spending more time in the personal side as opposed to getting down to the nitty and gritty. Certain kinds of media. So, okay. Um, you know, uh, Willamette Week, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. has basically turned into a tabloid uh, journalist type organization um, they would definitely and that's what they did when they when they um, tried to assassinate Fred's character oh, with gotcha. the article that they wrote about him right, right. I want in fact we want to spend more time with that but it isn't it is an issue because mm -hmm. I can remember I was interviewed by Willamette Week and, and several other are going whatever but again to you, you know, you're communicating to folks and a lot of times then you then you read about the results of what you shared, and you say, wait a minute, that's not what I said. Mm -hmm, right. Or that's not where, it, as, right. as opposed to just sticking to the issues and the solution to the issues. That's clear, right up front right. aspect of it. Yeah. Any personal issues, if they want that discussed, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, that should be part of the part of the filing process. Yeah. If you don't want to do it that way, that's fine, but the bottom line, I think mm -hmm. that would kind of like separate, you know, if a person then says, okay, I don't want to share that, they don't file, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the key, the main thing, 90% of it should be about the issue the issues. and the yeah. solution, because right. that's what we're all about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, with that, why don't we get into some, some candidates now? You know, right there, we I'm sure you guys are knocking on the doors and whatever, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do, we'll start off with the, I was going to say start off with the governor. I agree. But, but see, he's got the bank, and since you're the, you, you're the governor aspect of it, what are we doing, Bruce? What, if I were to ask you specifically, what is the top issue on your plate that you feel would, would better our way of life here in the state of Oregon and a solution to that issue? Well, um, I always go with jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, we, uh, with the recent ri rise in the minimum wage and then looking at IP28 where they're, they're basically going to try to raise business taxes 250%, those, those two, two issues are going to kill business in our state. So um, that's the number, number one thing. So, so specifically jobs. Well, give me something specifically about oh, jobs. Well, um, we, we want to we make Oregon a business magnet. So rather than... Rather than you know, raise minimum wage and, and, and do this 250% increase, what we're going to do after I win this primary is we're going to be talking about getting rid of the $1 billion in business taxes we currently pay, get rid of the $800 million in property taxes businesses currently pay. So, so businesses basically have no tax so that we make Oregon a business magnet. Businesses come here, they hire folks, and then you know, we're basically giving up about $1.3 billion a year in revenue and and all those people that get hired are going to be paying uh, personal income taxes. They're going to pay mo way more than 1.3 billion in personal income taxes of all the businesses that come. So, you know, everybody knows that businesses aren't paying the taxes. We're paying the taxes. We're just making businesses uncompetitive when when we tax them like that. So mm -hmm. that's the number one issue I think is is getting Oregon working. And uh, Kate Brown and and the folks that pass the minimum wage. Uh, act and then the ones looking at promoting IP 28 
that's a wrong way to go. We're going to be killing Oregon businesses, and it's not going to help Oregon at all. It's going to set us back. Well, the, uh, the public has been hearing about the fifteen dollars raise aspect yeah. of it. How do you react to that? And what are you what are you hearing on the on the on the, on the, on the, uh, the, the well the current the current uh, the current minimum wage w was just a ramp up. So this I think it's in June July this year. There's going to be the first raise on the minimum wage, and then it's going to ramp up over time. So. Um, my goal is to uh, win the governor's race, uh, the primary, use, use the money that we received in the primary to fund the House and Senate races so that we make sure that we have control of, of the House for sure, close on the Senate, enough to where we can change the law. Okay. And I, I don't think we're probably going to be able to roll minimum wage back. But we cut it off where it is right now and don't allow it to go up which, anymore. Which is it? Which is it now? Which is well, it's going to go up. I think it's a buck, buck an hour. Which is how much? Then? It's going to go what from nine mean? and a quarter to ten and a quarter, I believe, something like that, on this first raise. So, so, so basically, once we get control of the legislature, we're able to, to basically change the law where where it's not going to go up anymore. Okay. And you, feel the bleeding. you feel livability? It's okay at eleven, what, what eleven bucks an hour? Well, or see, here's the thing. You got to have businesses in the state of Oregon right. for people to work, okay. and the right way for labor co or labor uh, wages to go up is is to have so many businesses that there's not enough employees to go around to where the businesses have to pay more than minimum wage, mm -hmm. right? So they're actually bidding for workers, and then the and then the wage goes up because it's it's a supply and demand thing, and so. You know that gives that gives workers a lot more opportunity as far as where they want to work what they want to do and and there's and lots more opportunities for businesses in this state okay. so I, I just see it as a win-win situation all the way around uh, employers are going to get paid more there's going to be more opportunity for businesses and the state's going to get the additional revenue they need okay all right. so let's bring Jeff in the picture now. Jeff how, how about your platform how about yourself one. Certainly. Okay, you're, you're, the, you're the money handle for our state. I am. the. Uh, I'm a candidate for treasurer, and I am the only uh, candidate in the primary, so I haven't had any press attention to this point. There's other races that have multiple people in it. I suspect the press attention will uh, ramp up some after the primary here next well, that's month. That's why we're here. Yes, that's why. <laughs> and, it is. and it will ramp up from here. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. right. okay, good. But I'm a candidate for treasurer sure. because I believe that Oregon's next treasurer should actually have experience as a treasurer. I'm the current treasurer of the Legacy Emanuel Hospital Foundation. I'm a past treasurer of USA Olympic Swimming, as well as being an All-American swimmer myself. I have an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business, and two terms of elected experience on the Lake Oswego City Council, where my mantra has been, you know, live within our means, and we've been doing a good job on that, and focus on the basic infrastructure, the roads, the waters, and the sewers, because we cannot have a first-rate quality of life with a third-rate infrastructure. Yeah. And I want to continue that focus through the treasurer's office. Uh, the treasurer has three primary responsibilities. Uh, the first one is the management of the investments of the state, of which the largest element is the money set aside to fund the PERS uh, retirement. The second is the management of the debt of the state. I want to continue to make sure we get the best possible interest rates on the debt that we issue. And the third one is the treasurer is one of three members serving on the Oregon State Land Board, along with the governor and the secretary of state. So the focus is infrastructure, bridges, roads, because those, in turn, when we do that, we're creating good jobs. Those are good-paying jobs. And the best way to help people get out of poverty is to have a good job. And you can focus on that through infrastructure. And we have to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, what do you think? I mean, you're running for office. Evidently, there might be some issues mm -hmm. uh, with, that, with the present situation mm -hmm. as far as that office is concerned. Do you see any issues that you think may need to that you may be looking at in terms of changing or improving or whatever? Certainly. The, the one issue that is the big um, elephant in the room, uh, and I don't know if I should use the word elephant since I am the Republican nominee, oh, oh, but oh. I'll use the word elephant, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, the challenge we are facing with PERS. Uh, the Oregon State Supreme Court has ruled that um, any obligations that have been uh, accrued up to this point are sacrosanct. You can make changes going forward. But that, and that's going to give us uh, a huge unfunded uh, liability. Uh, right now, it's about $22 billion, and it's dollars with a B. And the treasurer, the governor, and the legislature are going to have to work hard to address that. And as the treasurer, uh, I anticipate working very closely 
uh, with the governor and the legislature to address fixing that challenge because we do it is a challenge and it is the big elephant in the room you know as a you know as a lay person I mean, I'm talking from the voter standpoint when that came out with reference to the Supreme Court's decision on that piece mm -hmm. the thing that I thought about was first thing that came into mind well they're all on purse too uh, yes they are well, didn't someone give thought, if you will, from the standpoint of bringing maybe an outside Supreme Court to come in and, mm -hmm. and, and judge on this issue? What do you think? Well, Any the, thoughts about that? Uh, it is a challenge. The, uh, you know, I've, I always go from the basic assumption that I don't question people's integrity. Uh, I may question their judgment, but not their integrity. Um, I think it was a very good faith effort on the part of uh, uh, the past governor and the past legislature to address the challenge. Uh, the Supreme Court and the members of the Supreme Court, they came to the conclusion using their judgment that no, it was not going to, not going to stand. Um, I think it was, uh, I think it could have gone another way because it would have meant you know, addressing a big challenge because the goal is to provide a, a decent retirement to the people who have worked um, in any branch of the government. But uh, conflict of interest legally, that's been looked at on a number of occasions, and the courts uh, across the country have said that is not a conflict of interest. Mm, okay, okay. And I'm not an attorney, so I will accept that judgment. Okay. Well, I got another lay person. Yes, Jimmy, you had a question? You got in that? Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm going to get to the governor. I'm going to get to the governor. Well, I just want to say I do support the, um, the minimum wage increase. Um, I was a Democrat previously. Now I don't have a political party because I'm really disappointed in both. But I support the increase because um, rents keep skyrocketing in Portland. Mm -hmm. The cost of living keeps going up and people who work in fast food restaurants um, need to be able to survive, especially if they're working full time. There's a big argument along the lines of fast food work shouldn't be considered a career. Unfortunately, there are people that are very, fairly unskilled and, and that will be their career. Um, another thing people say is, um, why should they get $15 an hour for flipping burgers? I know because um, I know a couple of people who work in fast food restaurants, it's a lot more involved than flipping burgers. It's mopping floors, it's dealing with people, it's breaking up fist fights, it's, it's counting out the till. It, the, the skills that a person has working in fast food are far more complex than just flipping burgers. So that's my take on that. Okay. <laughs> Governor, you've heard two, two interesting situations here. You got two, well, you got the layperson right here, but you got the treasurer right there, right? Yep. And that point about, well, how would you react had you been governor and when the Supreme Court came down from the standpoint of saying, well, hey, uh, the purse is going to be just that way? Would you, would you have a question that? that uh, well, I, I kind of view PERS as a contract. I don't think they should have, they've been trying to break the contract in the first place, you know? So, I, you know, I wouldn't have been supportive of, of the the changes they were trying to make anyway. I mean, I, you know, I'm a real estate agent. When you make a contract with somebody, you, you keep it. And I and I kind of viewed that as trying to break the contract when you have to go to court. Somebody's trying to break a contract, mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't agree with that at all. I I, I think that we got to get Oregonians working so we have additional money coming into the state, so that so that we can meet our obligations to our to our employees for the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. But like I said, it's it's a big issue right now. You got, yeah. I mean, you got people that are not working. No question. It's a big we issue. We don't we don't have businesses coming back, and that's the other from a national perspective. We're going to have a national. We're going to have a person here that's going to come up here, Delinda, and naturally she's going to have to be in the in the in, yep. the, in that whole up in D.C. area trying to figure out how mm -hmm. do we get jobs back. But there's a ba back. there's a basic issue though. I, I mean, I I think nobody in the legislature. And nobody in the judiciary should be in the PERS system. They should be in the private system themselves. They, you know, because because anybody anybody that's ruling on that, as far as from the legislative point of view, or anybody that's making judge judgments about that, shouldn't be in the system. I agree. So yeah, so there's just a, you know, regardless of whether they say there's a conflict of interest, there. I mean, when you're ruling on your own yeah, retirement exactly. fund, there's there's an inherent conflict. Exactly, of I agree with so, that. So so I w yeah. I just like to see them get out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't have our elected officials in it. Number mm -hmm. one, and we shouldn't have anybody in the judiciary in it either. Mm -hmm. in the is a system. complex thing. Yeah. I am not an expert, and I don't know a lot about it. I mean, to be honest that's the truth but you know my husband Don Dupay was a Portland police officer mm -hmm. and he was a police officer for 17 years and he was denied a pension um, at a time in 1978 he was denied a pension because he resigned for health reasons and I feel like he was uh, wrongly denied that pension mm -hmm. uh, and PERS was it was different then but 
um, legally, but it's definitely a complex kind of situation. Now, if I can recall, maybe you guys can correct me one way or the other. I think you are going and took the position of the of the, of the voting public, <coughs> and then on on the purse thing. Remember when when they came out, they had the discussion. They mm -hmm. talked about this whole piece mm -hmm. about the, about that. Mm -hmm. I believe they, the Oregonian. I think I, well, I, I, I may, my memory may be incorrect on that, yeah. but I think the Oregonian did come out in support of the legislation the, yeah, well, that okay. was passed. Yeah, they're, 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 uh, but I, I'm not 100 percent sure. But I think they did. Right, and then and then then they went to the court, and then it was appealed and to then yes, repeal, and then it was that was repealed. Yes, but the public but, most but, of it. Yes, but yeah, but that, but again, that's the point I, that, that I yeah. that that Cuff is making, and, and like you're saying, mm -hmm. the public from say, hey, wait a minute. Well, so then you ask yourself the question: Well, who who's in control? Mm -hmm. Is it a yeah. government of the people, by the people, or for the people? And I'm not trying to, you know, th that that's a very nonpartisan issue aspect yeah. of it. And it's mm -hmm. kind of it's, it's it's kind of hard to to suggest that a person is going to decrease their own wages yeah it, it right. just don't work that yeah. way i mean it, not not in our society it, it, i think yeah mm -hmm. you know what i mean to a certain degree it seems like it's it's an inherent compl uh, conflict yeah. of interest i mean it just seems so Im unethical to me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so i'm thinking about when well, i'm making that point because um jeff you being the treasurer you you got the money you're going to know exactly how much money we got what we can spend what we can't spend that kind of a deal mm -hmm. you're going to be at the table and because yes, I think be. this is still going to be an issue because it's going to be a lot of hardship yep. on a lot of folks on our education system. I mean, a lot of services that we're providing right now, uh, all of a sudden, a lot of that stuff's going to be cut as a result of that. Yes. And and folks are going to be saying, well, what about my kids here? What about this, this, that? And mm -hmm. We're already talking about the education piece. Like, for instance, here in the city of Portland, uh, we've got the largest school district in the state of Oregon. And there's no voc ed for these kids. Right. And all yes. these social issues that we're concerned about, gang members and all that other stuff, and and uh, <laughs> low-income housing, we don't have, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we need housing and this, that, and the other. And it's all about money. And in and, mm -hmm. and education, the sports and music, all those yes. programs I had when I attended Chapman Elementary, mm -hmm. sports and music and voc ed and career ed, all those programs are being cut. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really tragic mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that's again that's the other reason about making sure that we know what the issues are right and the solution right. to the issues when we come to the table for this new election year aspect of it mm -hmm. and whoever's sitting in those seats right now uh, they should be able to say okay doing that orientation but this is where we are on these these heavy issues yes so then it becomes public and then the public and ie folks like yourselves can respond to that when you mm -hmm. do file mm -hmm. This is how I would attack this issue, mm -hmm. if, if in fact, uh, blah, 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 because that's why you're filing to run for office. You're not just doing it for, for game show aspect of it. You know, we, we need leadership. Mm -hmm. And let, just, permit me to follow up on one of the ways that we can have more revenue coming into um, the state government, as well as our local governments and the schools. We have a rate of business formation in our state, Oregon, less than the national average. And we have a rate of labor force participation. That is the number of people who can work, who are working in the, in the age group spanning your lifetime of work. We're below the national averages on both of those. Just by getting up to the national average will generate tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of increased taxes, because when you're working, you're paying taxes. Right, exactly. That's coming into the state. Now, that's hard day-to-day -day slogging away mm -hmm. to work at that, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying that there is some magic bullet to accomplish it. But by focusing on that hard day-to-day -day work, being providing opportunities for businesses to form so we just get to the national average to get people working uh, for labor force participation rate just to the national average is something that we should uh, focus on day and night mm -hmm. and one example of that it's not a responsibility in the treasurer's office but it's something that can be done through uh, the governor's office and through the legislature is the part of the funding that we now provide both in colleges and community colleges and universities is based upon the number of students who are enrolled. Mm -hmm. Well, if you are receiving money and you're incentivized based on the number of students you're enrolling, what are you going to do? You're going to focus on enrolling students. Mm -hmm. Whereas the outcome we're trying to get is students graduating and mm -hmm. more importantly getting students working. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's take some of the money, maybe even all of the money, but at least some of the money mm -hmm. to say to our universities, to say or to our community colleges, we, we are going to provide money to you based upon the number of students who are working six months after graduation. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have all the specifics of that, right, but right, the right. concept is you want to have the money to match the, to go with the incentive. Right. 
and the incentive ought to be getting as many people working as possible, mm -hmm. which again provides the revenues to the state to provide for the programs and the services that we all want. That's a really good point, the, what he just said about um, uh, the, the city promoting, you know, more students in community colleges and universities. And I can say, you know, my master's is in adult education, leadership and policy. That's exactly what they do. They want to get students to come in. Unfortunately, a lot of students in Portland at Portland Community College and enrolling at PSU are enrolling um, with um, a lot of challenges in math and writing and English. They've got to take remedial courses mm -hmm. just to get caught up. Mm -hmm. So there's more of a focus on getting students to come in and not as much of a focus on getting students to graduate because mm -hmm. that actually requires more effort, time, and money. Mm -hmm. And that should definitely be a focus. Yeah. Well, you know, again, on that same, on that your point aspect, there, that was the <laughs> rationale for voc ed. Mm -hmm. How do you right. get people mm -hmm. more m yeah. motivated, if you will, mm -hmm. to get involved with uh, their studies, the reading, mm -hmm. writing, the arithmetic aspect mm -hmm. of it? Yeah. And, and in an urban area, let's say like a city of Portland aspect of it, you know, as opposed to a rural area, the kids just don't have that enthusiastic mm -hmm. thing to do that. Get my point? Mm -hmm. But if you give them the car, the automobile, and carpentry and all that other good stuff it just makes a lot of sense but unfortunately we don't have that here I think Portland State is getting a lot better at providing support for students when I was a, an undergrad um, years ago they um, they didn't have half the programs they have now they didn't even have a, a, an orientation when I transferred over um, and I did everything I got all the information and schlepped around all by myself you know but now they have a lot more programs um, and I think they're making an effort to help students um, progress in their studies so that they graduate, but we need more students um, graduating from from PCC with the two-year transfer yeah, degree. Yeah, the, the blue collar stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe that might be something, we've been talking about that issue mm -hmm. from the standpoint that during those formative years, normally we're guaranteed those form, during those formative years, mm -hmm. uh, one through 12, right? Mm -hmm. And you graduate. Yeah. Maybe we should add that other two years and, and pick up that community college piece. Yes. You got mm -hmm. my point? So yes. when they graduate, they got that blue collar that's already intact. Yeah. And then if they want to opt to go to co college mm -hmm. and this, that, and the other, mm -hmm. they can on their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. saying? Yes. Same way. That's a thought. So what we're going to do now, well, I'm just going to give her another blurb in regards to the fact that I want to make sure you guys know that, that Teresa here is a writer in her own rights, and her husband is also a writer. He's also uh, considered as my police commissioner when I'm mayor. Aspect of it. We're going we're to give her a, a couple of words on that piece, and then we're going to take a short break. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to bring the congressperson who's going to be representing us up in D.C., and then we'll have a discussion with the three of you guys. Okay. okay. Well, this is my husband's book. I was the editor. Um, he first wrote this book in 91, 92, and submitted it once. It was rejected, and then he kept it in a suitcase under his bed. We began working on this in 2012. This and we worked on it for about two and a half years. Um, the second edition is coming out within a, about a week or so. Um, it will have four new photographs, and it will have um, another story, a very dramatic yeah, story. Real good piece. Um, Behind the Badge in River City. And uh, then this is my second book. My first book I co-authored with J.D. Chandler, uh, which was published through the History Press. It's called Murder and Scandal in Prohibition Portland, Sex, Vice, and Misdeeds in Mayor Baker's Reign. That was my first book. This is my second book. It's a book of poetry. Um, it comes highly recommended. It's called Blue Reverie and Smoke. And Dan Raphael wrote the, wrote the introduction. And... Uh, Dan Raphael that. wrote the introduction, and Margaret Malone uh, also has a blurb on the front cover, and there's a blurb from J.D. Chandler and Good. Sean Davis. Um, it's just a book of my poems. It spans um, from 2001 to 2016. It's got, I think, 72 poems in yeah. it. <laughs> Real good. She's really good. And we've interviewed those, by the way, here on the Oregon Voters Digest. So if you want to go back in our directory, you can get that mm -hmm. in the directory aspect. She'll be back on anyway and do that piece. So it's been great been great what we're going to do we're going to take a short break and we want to thank you for being with us thank as the late person don't leave and these guys are going to be around and then we're going to bring uh, the lender on and we're going to talk a little bit more okay thank good. you we'll take a short break we'll be right back thank you. you are watching oregon voters digest this program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times Tell a friend.
Thanks again for joining us. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host of Oregon Voters Digest. Like I said before at the beginning, hey, we're right in, hey, we're right into politics now. We're in the in the prime when uh, when the primary right now. We, we will know the result come May 17th, and it's very very important at that that point in time. It really gets serious. Again, it talks about issues and solutions. That's where I'm coming from. That's where I'll always be coming from. And so, as you know, if you saw the first part of the, if you saw the first part of the show, you got an idea of what we were talking about. Had a layperson aspect of it. We talked a little bit about it in general. We talked about Oregon and what the issues are in Oregon. And we had a couple of couple of uh, individuals who were running for office, one in the treasurer and one for governor. And I think that's a very neat piece. As far as I'm concerned, it's nonpartisan. Issues are nonpartisan. Issues are hey, issues are nonpartisan, and solutions are very nonpartisan. Bottom line, it takes money. So we got a treasurer here, and we got a we got a guy who's running for governor. So that's really great. But now, all of a sudden, we got that other excuse the French that other zoo that we've all identified and said we've always given them a thumbs down. It's called Congress up in D.C. But you know, for some strange reason, those folks are elected from here. And in, in, in the old days, it was bringing the bacon home aspect of it. But now, all of a sudden, we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated and. And we're trying to figure out how do we fit these people to come here now because the money goes up there too. We got our treasurer here locally, got our own state money, but we got that other big pot of money. We're supposed to be getting our little piece there too. But the people that's kind of gotten to the point where we got to bring these people back to the table. So they've got a they've got an F grade. But I tell you what, I've got somebody sitting here with me right now, running in district number two. I've known this lady for one. quite some time. District one. See, I'm already putting two. See, it showed you what, what, how I feel about that whole area of that zoo up there aspect of it. But the Linda, I mean, she comes back with some major, major credentials. Uh, one of the main ones that I know of is the fact that uh, uh, she's had some Marine Corps involved, involvement. In it, but I don't know. But, but that, that makes her really good. Well, I tell you, she's a CO just like I've got my wife. She's a CO at my home. But the fact of the matter is, Delinda, in all due respect, is a very unique person. Uh, she's very family-oriented and, and um, a very hard-working person. I mean, I can go on and on about her about her history and whatever, but I want to just get right down to the meat of the matter and just I want to introduce her and, and say, Delinda, you're going to be going to Congress. Now, the thing I is, hope to, you're yes. You're going to be going to Congress, and as you can see, we got problems. We have and, big problems. And we want that bacon to come home, too, okay, and, and what, talk about our issues, right? And, yes, and what do you need here in Oregon? You need an infrastructure expert. That's me. An infrastructure expert. I'm an infrastructure expert. I have been in construction my entire life, even as a child. I was bouncing around in the back seat of my dad's uh, construction vehicle. Usually it was a car. He was project manager. My father broke the world's record in pouring the most amount of concrete in the least amount of time. He was in a world magazine. He actually worked for the country of Mexico to teach them about their infrastructure. Hmm. So my roots are deep I in infrastructure. That. I know that. I want to also make clear that when 9-11 happened and the World Trade Center came down, I had friends that worked across the street in the banking industry. And one of the things that was so sad is they had to go to work every day and smell that and see that burning mm -hmm. rubble. Mm -hmm. It was sad. Hmm. So who cleaned it up? International Union of Operating Engineers. That's who went in there and cleaned it up. They are the force to be reckoned with when it's a major construction project. You could call the operating engineers and you can get a thousand people that are trained with the money from the people who are working. You could call them up today and get people that are experts in construction. And for the benefit of the, the viewing audience, I know what operating engineers are. What do they do? Operating engineers operate all equipment. They operate railroads, the, the engineer in the, uh, in the engine car is an operating engineer. Track hose, back hose, any equipment that moves, they operate all the plants, concrete plants, asphalt plants, aggregate plants. The uh, Pays well too, right? The Port of Portland. Okay, keep going. The people that are working at the Port of Portland operating the cranes or the sky cranes on buildings yeah, okay. are operating engineers. Longshoremen have not done well for anyone in the state of Oregon. Longshoremen want to sit and watch what operating engineers do and be paid for that because it's at the Port of Portland. The Secretary of Transportation, I believe, came here when all that was going on and what they did was not good for Portland or the ports. That's who ran everyone out of here. Mm -hmm. 
And yes, it does come down to money. But do you want one person who's trained to do the job, to do the job and pay them the correct wage and not have someone sitting in a chair watching him? Okay. Let me do, yes. let me, let's do, me, do, let me do you a favor here. Because I'm telling you that she's got background, big time background. I mean, that's the port. We, you know, those jobs that, that we oh. lost, lost a lot of jobs of recently on that path. But I want to get back down to, and then we can we can have another piece on that. I want to, these guys here. Yeah. They've already kind of shared. We've talked about their issues and they've talked about solutions. Now, what about yourself? What specific issues do you think we feel we we, we, gonna, we want you to take up to Congress? That I think they respond to Oregon, Oregon as far as Oregon's problems. The issues are very clear. The issues to me are infrastructure, education, and personal small business. And I'll start with small business but first. No, just, just give me one, because we gotta have this okay. discussion. I wanna get these guys to the table. We Let's start with small minutes. business. I have education and infrastructure also, but, but small business owners are the backbone of any workforce. Small business owners, the more money they have in their pockets, the more they do for their employees. The things that have been going on with the government, the state government, mm -hmm. trying to squeeze small businesses for every penny they have is what has caused the problem. Once they relieve that pressure from small businesses, they can hire more, they can buy more materials. And when you think about it, if someone's able to expand right there, how many jobs are they, are they providing for our communities? Small businesses need to have the pressure taken off of them because they are the ones that will bring us out of this so you, recession. So you think you're going to be able to go down to Congress and you're going to get that legislation through that would benefit Bruce Cuff over here because he, he's looking for he's looking just for that. He's looking for jobs. You are know, you going to be able to do that for him? Yes, and I'll tell you how I know this because I have a reputation for working myself out of a job. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes me feel better than to be produ productive and to work myself into a position that everything is running smoothly, my job is done. That's what I want to do. That is what I'm after. It's not that I desire to go to Washington because that's where I want to do my work. I think that the work I do there will represent Oregon. And if I can privatize everything possible so that the government is not doing it and we're not paying PERS and we're not paying all the benefits. We are paying for a product 100% right at the beginning. We are subbing it out. If it's not an essential necessity like the police department, the fire department, things that we have to have, then I think it should be privatized. Okay. I don't think we should pay $50 an hour to have somebody mow the lawn at the state capitol. I think that a, my 10 year old son could have done it. Mm -hmm. I think that you sub that out to a landscaping company and then you put more people to work. Okay, let's hold on for a second. Bruce, well you've heard, you've given, she's given you a little background in terms of what, um, who she is and, and how, what kind of a person she's gonna be up there in Washington. Mm -hmm. Is she gonna be representing us right? And is, is, is she going the right direction in terms of what our needs are? Well, You're the governor. Well, uh, you know. Share the thoughts. <clears throat> let's talk. The way I look at the government is they just need to get out of the way. Especially a small business, and that what I'm hearing her say is, she's going to remove some of those obstacles. Small business, like what, Bruce? What well, um, just regulation in general that that cripples them. You know, Obamacare uh, is one that's just killing the the recent raise of the minimum wages. All, all those kind of things hurt small businesses, and whenever we uh, put additional regulations on them, whether it's OSHA. Or you know, coming through and just checking on them, basically harassing them. I mean, that hurts small business. Uh, I think for the most part, they want to do a good job. They want to do it safely. They don't want to harm their employees. You know, um, we 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 just need to get government off their back so they can do what they do, and that's make a profit so that they can hire people. And, you know, one of the things I want to make sure we clear up. We need to understand it. Government is not just a foreign entity. Government is a is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we should not we should make sure we understand that because because it's affecting people. It's yeah. affecting us all. Because too often we, it's like as if it's a foreign entity. It's not a foreign entity. It's, it's us. I mean, don't get me wrong. You, you that's what you do. Yeah. We, we, we we've been doing it so long making that statement and it gets in the way a lot of times in terms of solutions i'm just throwing that out on the table anybody can anybody want to dispute that any thoughts well i, I just think when when ronald reagan says you know somebody comes and they say i'm from the government and, my, and i'm here to help you that's, that's the last thing you want to hear but what is the government to you? well 
a, a lot of people look at the government as bureaucrats. But you know the bureaucrat. I know, but what I'm saying is, I know, what, I understand. Who, I understand that well, government who are the bureaucrats? is bureaucrats. What are you talking about? Well, you I'm talking saying about? somebody from OSHA or somebody from the IRS or somebody from you know. I, give give you a list of okay. you know unconstitutional agencies that the federal government has that in, in, that impact our life every day. But they were hired by. Well, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily well, well, mean we need them. <laughs> but, but they well, were appointed. No. They weren't elected. That's correct. Many of these agencies are appointed. They're not elected. Okay. By the bureaucracy. By the people that we elect. Okay, okay. now we're getting down to business. So right the there. people that we elect, some of them become career politicians. That's all they want to do is sit around on the public dole and take that mm. money. That is not what government should be. So term limits comes in. How do you feel about term limits? I love term limits. You like term you limits? You know, in term, we have term limits in uh, Yamhill County mm -hmm. for commissioner. Okay, mm -hmm. At the end of their term limits, they start to mentor the people that want to come into that office mm -hmm. because there's no competition. They already know they're going out. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was meant to be so that they have their turn in, you know, the, the queue doing their job, and then the um, new people coming in are mentored by the people that are leaving. Mm -hmm. And everyone should be treated the same at that point. Is if that you, something you might lobby when you get up to Congress? I would love to, Consider yes. that kind of a deal? Those kind of ideas that make common sense. Plus, mm -hmm. I, I believe from the bottom of my heart that elected officials should have worked in the private sector. They know. They have their, their mm -hmm. finger on the pulse. My, we had a family construction company when I was young, and we... One Thanksgiving, there was, it was hardships. It was the 80s. It was right when Reagan became president. It was, we, everyone was poor. Yeah. My father said, look, we have a little extra money this year. Find out who doesn't have turkeys this Thanksgiving and let's buy everybody a turkey. Mm -hmm. So the whole crew went out and talked to neighbors and relatives and friends. And my father probably bought about 35 turkeys mm -hmm. that year mm -hmm. so that everyone could have a turkey. Mm -hmm. That's what private corporations do. I don't know why they try to make co private corporations the bad guy. But I'm They're actually the good guys. I'm agreeing with you with, with under one standing. We're still in a, a dispute right now, a divide, if you will, as far as, far as uh, livable wages. That's, that's big right now throughout mm -hmm. the country. How do you deal with that? You got, you got, in fact, well, even within our own state, we get, we're having a problem. Bruce going to have to deal with that piece big in time. In my opinion, those starting jobs were never meant to be permanent. No. And what I feel, and it goes to education, is you have to have the carrot, not the stick. In Yamhill High School, mm -hmm. my children had the option of taking wood shop, welding. Mm -hmm. We had every program you can imagine. We probably had 25,000 hours of volunteer time from parents and other, uh, you know, people in the community, grandparents. But that's how it should be. So let's say that a school can uh, have three or more programs that are optional. If the children have good attendance, they make good grades, and the teacher and parents agree, then they should be able to choose whatever op optional class they want, whether, mm -hmm. whether it be wood shop, dance, singing. So I, is vocate for all the kids, or is it vocate for, for just a select? For team? all the kids that okay, are, ha yeah. are earning good grades, passing grades, and their parents agree, and they have good attendance. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to get productivity out of them, plus whatever optional class they go to, they will be learning in that class also. Mm -hmm. One a woman at the black political um, group here in Portland, mm -hmm. she stood up and she says, I like what you're saying, but we tried that in a Portland school, and all they wanted to do was hip hop. And I said, but what's wrong with hip hop? First of all, you could have been teaching them music at the same time. Learning to read music teaches them math. It makes math easier. So why can't you incorporate other things along with their dancing and their music? You can always add education in. They don't have to know it's education. Mm -hmm. Well, in all due respect, that was charter schools, not vocate. There's a difference between charter school and vocate. Well, I think, she, I think she meant the regular public I, 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 I was familiar with that particular okay. piece. Mm -hmm. You're right. But I'm just saying is that when, when, when my thing is a holistic approach. you got to get all the kids have to be involved. Every in kid has to be involved. In mm -hmm. our schools, we offered, because we had a martial arts school, we offered martial arts mm -hmm. as a, a self-defense program for mm -hmm. all the seniors that were graduating. Mm -hmm. That was just something we did. If you get the community involved. But what's happening right now is the 
schools and the teachers hands are tied by the unions so they don't want free help they don't want anyone taking over their classrooms or their schools that's what's going on that's wrong you what, must what, tell me this now do you feel comfortable in saying you'll be able to bring all the necessary people to the table to have those discussions? I'm going to find union, non-union, anybody. The idea is yeah. we got it. We need a solution, and you got to be able to communicate to everybody. Everybody, you know, everyone has to, to be that involved. Point. That's yeah. fair. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Sure. Look, we got about six minutes left. I'd like to give each one of you a, a minute or so just to close in regards to to the public out there. Whatever you want to say. Start off with the governor. Gov, how you doing? Well, I'm doing good. Um, Give me a minute. We're going around the state, you know, campaigning and uh, looking forward to meeting people. We uh, we make it a habit of, of of actually going. We don't just get skyped in. We we actually make it a habit of going around the state. I was in Burns yesterday, and and uh, I uh, closed out yesterday in uh, Redmond in a in a uh, VFW hall for a fundraiser. It was a good day. So um, tomorrow. Um, well, I don't know where I'm going tomorrow. I got the whole week full of stuff that I'm doing. So, but um, I, I'd love to have your support. And and on my Facebook page and okay. www.timeforcuff.org is the name of the website. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I we post on there where we're going and whatnot. So. Okay. He's also a vet too, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. I, am. I mean, he doesn't have his cover on right now, but he's a <laughs> he's a true vet. A lot of times we we tend not to say that, but it's, <laughs> thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Jeff? You bet. Thank you. As I mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, I believe that Oregon's next treasurer should actually have experience as a treasurer. I am completely supportive of the term limits. There is a term limits for the treasurer's office, and I'm not interested in taking any position uh, after the treasurer's office like governor or secretary of state. Mm -hmm. I want to serve two terms as treasurer and make sure that the job of the treasurer, which is where I want to bring my focus, the tr job of the treasurer is not just to count the money. The job of the treasurer is to make the money count. And that's going to be my role. That's what I want to focus on while treasurer. So I'm out asking for your people's support. I'm asking for their help. You can learn more about me at my website at www.jeffgudman.org. And I look forward to upcoming debates uh, with the other people running for the treasurer's office. And I anticipate uh, be winning the election in November. You know, just real quick, like um, you, you said you were only interested in two terms. That's correct. At most. And you are from the private sector aspect of it. So in, indirectly, you're doing a pub, public servant aspect, aspect of it. You're not looking at it from a career standpoint. No, no. I've, my elected service I've had so far gives me a good knowledge of how government works and the differences between the city government and the state government it, with respect to the treasurer's position it's just there's more zeros but the concepts are the same and i can bring that my knowledge is the arc of my experience to bear no one wakes up in the morning or no one is born saying i want to be the treasurer of oregon mm -hmm. but my education my business experience my volunteer experience and my elected experience makes me uniquely qualified to be oregon's next treasurer mm -hmm. And then, well, it, 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 you've heard the, the local aspect of it. You're going to be going to the Washington aspect of it, and you're already going into a situation where we, i.e., all of us around the country, for that matter, have given them a sort of a downgrade aspect of it. How are you going to get us motivated? How are you going to get them motivated up there to, to deal with some of the issues that you're going to be bringing to the table, like term limits and other things like that? We've even we've not talked a little bit about the immigration aspect of it because that's still sitting on the table. That's huge. And it's I know you've got some you've got some thoughts about that too. And your quote, why don't you just kind of talk a little bit about how do you bring that things back together? Because the governor's waiting and the treasurer's waiting there with his money. Okay, talk. thank you, Bruce. It's Delinda Morgan, and I, my uh, website is Delinda Morgan for Congress. And I was very disappointed in David Wu, who was the congr congressman before Bonamici, representing me. That's mm -hmm. not the kind of person I want to be represented by, and that is why I jumped into this race. Mm -hmm. I won't give it up until I see that someone in that office is hardworking, knows the private sector, and is in it for the people. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. I have knowledge in many, many things. When I was very young, and I had a love for construction, and that is my first love, I must say, but when I was in high school, I decided that I wanted to work at a bank. So my very first job was working at a bank about three years, and I learned every department. Every, anyone could leave me in any department as a teller, in notes, new accounts, and I could do the job. I loved it. It, it was a very um, enlightening process 
the thing that I loved most when I worked at banks was balancing checkbooks. Believe it or not, there are people that never would enter their checks and they, where am I, what am I doing? I love to help them and show them the light of what actually is going on. I could do that all day and be happy so helping people. Do me a favor, real quick, like, what's the first thing you're going to say to Congress to tell us what you're going to be doing? I'm going to say... On the table. What, what are you going to put on the table? The say, very hey. first thing in my committee, I'm going to walk in and say, we need to improve our relationships with our own congressional districts. That's the number one thing that we're here for. What does that do? Well, what that does is... It makes people wake up. We have to wake up and know that the people that hired us expect solutions. Right. They expect something for, for their vote. That's what they're giving you is their vote. Yeah. So if you go over there and you decide to make friends with everyone in Congress and you're not getting anything accomplished, then you should be fired. Mm -hmm. I think that every career politician who has gone in there and been a low productive congressperson like Wu and, in my opinion, Bonamici, mm -hmm. who's in there right now, Low production, you're fired. Okay, fired. That's the last <laughs> word. Remember, when you vote, you got to say fired, fired. You are fired. You can't run. <laughs> Bottom line is that folks, it's, it's a serious, well, serious times right now. Okay. So my point is that study it. You got your manuals now. You got your voters' pamphlets aspect of it. You're going to be getting your 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 your, your, actually your ballot in the mail another mm -hmm. couple of weeks or whatever for the primary. Then it's going to be up for the general. Okay. Bruce, may well, I? Well, uh, well, it's done. We okay. got done. Well, I'll bring you back. We'll bring you back okay. up here again. But thanks very much, guys. Appreciate okay. it very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Bruce. All right. Thank Have you a good one. Talk to you next week. You know what I forgot to say What'd though? What is Tuesday is the final day to register as a Republican. That's right. You cannot vote for me if you're not a Republican because right? it's a closed primary. That's right. We'll change the rules. No. <laughs> no. No. I'll, I'll check with Lance. No we'll, underhanded. We'll get, we'll get that squared away. Right, Lance? There you but go, Tuesday's buddy. Tuesday's the final We're day. Off. I don't know if this airs before Tuesday, but Tuesday's the final oh, day that someone can we're register. We're going to do something on, on, on Facebook.